Hello and welcome everybody and I'm back. <laughs> That's right. This is Jeff Tobe and I'm the primary color at Coloring Outside the Lines. I know you missed me. I was away last month, you know, and it's always worrisome because I hear Kaylee Thomas, our behind the scenes expert, did an amazing job at hosting the webinar. That's what you call non job security. So I had to come back. Glad to be with you. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to another edition of Lab Manager Academy webinars presented by Lab Manager Magazine. Before we go any further, I'd like to introduce our gracious and generous sponsor, Tara Lucci of Unity Lab Services. Tara? Thank you, Jeff. Um, as always, we're proud to be a sponsor of this valuable webinar series for lab managers. I'm really looking forward to today's webinar on getting the controlled environment under control. Before we begin, I'd like to share some information with you regarding Unity Lab Services' customer-centric solutions, developed specifically to maximize your lab workflow through innovative services that drive productivity. An overview of these services can be seen on the right-hand side of your screen. In addition to traditional instrument level service offerings such as support plans, training, and parts and accessories, we also offer a full suite of enterprise services that provide service solutions for all instrumentation and equipment in a lab. If it's in your lab, we can manage it for you. Enterprise level services include consulting services, supply management services, asset management services, and scientific support services. Over the past few years, I've had the privilege to meet many of you and I've had heard countless of examples about the difficulties of balancing the core work of your lab in addition to activities like scheduling routine maintenance for equipment, handling service calls, and managing service invoices. The integrated Unity Lab Services solution simplifies service to allow you to focus on what's most important. One of the most common questions we hear is, how can we use a service provider to lessen the burden of administrative work, gain optimal tracking and metrics for service activity, and maximize lab productivity? To answer that question, we put together the informational webinar you see on your screen, Co-Sourcing Lab Services, the Advantages of Partnering versus Outsourcing. We recognize that you are asked to balance a wide variety of activities to achieve the best results within your lab. To help you evaluate support for that activity, this webinar will discuss how to leverage a service provider as a partner, hybrid programs that allow laboratories to maximize internal resources as well as external expertise can deliver streamlined results, enhance efficiency, and lower total operating costs. To learn more, we invite you to listen to this webinar, which can be found in the resources list box in your webinar window. Finally, we invite you to enjoy today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tara. I mean, getting the lab environment under control is what Unity Lab Services does. And so I hope you'll consider them for your lab as your service provider. And as, um, they are the reason we're able to bring you some of the top thought leaders in the world on a monthly basis. Today's webinar is Getting the Controlled Environment Under Control. And before I introduce our presenter, please know that he welcomes your questions throughout the presentation. So many of you have been with us for a long time, but those joining us for the first time, just type in your query in the chat box and we'll try to get to it during our short time together. Uh, if we don't get to your question by the end of the webinar, Randy, our presenter, has agreed to answer your questions offline. So please don't be shy. Ask questions throughout the, the uh, presentation. Also, I want to let you know that to make sure that everyone has access to the webinar after the fact, Every webinar is posted up on the web about one week after airing, so you can get the entire presentation if you like. Just watch your email for more details. Uh, for the archived webinars, you can also go to labmanager.com and look at Lab Manager Academy webinars. So let's get on with the reason you're here. I was going to do a longer introduction with more details, but this is what Randy gave me and asked me to read. Over the last 25 years, our presenter today has sold a lot of stuff, managed a bunch of people, and done a lot of training. Please help me welcome Randy Anderson. Well, thanks, Jeff. I, uh, the reason I have Jeff read that, uh, that introduction with very little detail is I figure you don't care nearly as much what I've done with the last 25 years of my life as what I do with the next a little bit less than an hour of yours. 
Uh, you know, when we look at, at being productive in today's world, it is something that seems to be more and more challenging, uh, but more and more it is expected of everyone. And when we think about um, getting organized, most of the time uh, when, when I ask somebody, what does it mean to get organized, their response will have something to do with cleaning up, throwing things away, or some well-intentioned uh, resolution to keep their workspace neat. Um, as we're going to discuss today, it really has a lot more to do uh, with uh, a broader perspective on things in the workplace than just how neat your desk is or how little clutter, how much clutter there is that's visible on your workspace. So as we get started, as Jeff said, I, I very much welcome um, your input, your questions. If you will send those in, I want to ask you to start off. We're going to get to this in just in a very few minutes. I want to ask you if you would type in, if you would send in some of your biggest challenges when it comes to being organized, personal productivity, general efficiency, or even time management in the workplace. If you'll type those in, we're going to get to those in just a minute, but that will give you an opportunity to get those uh, on the board so that when it does come up, uh, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about your specific challenge. Um, you know, one disclaimer I feel like I always have to put on time management, uh, life balance, uh, any of those kind of trainings that I'm doing, communication skills or whatever it is, I wish that today was just a call in to order a magic pill and everything to suddenly be fixed. Uh, but there are no magic pills. I will share with you many ideas today, uh, but the challenge for you is how will you apply those ideas and what will you do with them? Uh, I'm going to be very rapid fire and giving you as many ideas as I can during this time. And as Jeff said, if you have questions afterwards, if you want follow-up or help on how to implement those, please, please, please feel free to contact me or email me uh, via phone or, or email after the, after the webinar is over. Um, before I begin to talk about how to get better organized, I think we need to spend a few minutes talking about why we get better organized. Um, I, I often pose people in time management seminars with the question, and I'll pose you with it today also, what is a rich person? What is a rich person? You know, a lot of people have a dollar amount in mind that if I could just make this much, life would be fine. Um, you know, millionaire doesn't seem to be as rich as it once did. Uh, I've got a friend who says a rich person is somebody that makes $30,000 a year more than you do. And I would say that if we were all in a room together and asked for a show of hands, I would get almost everyone in the room would raise their hand if I said, if I dumped, $30,000 into your lap right now, how many of you know exactly what you would do with it? You would pay off a credit card, pay off a vehicle, possibly pay off a house, make an investment or buy you know, a vacation home. But if you had an extra hour every day, what would you do with that? You know, do you have a plan for what you would do with that extra time? I want to uh, challenge you as we get started in your thoughts about being organized with this, what I call my statement of intention. And it's the fact that you will not live an outstanding life by accident. You can only live an outstanding life by forming habits and creating discipline that will allow you to achieve excellence every single day. And I came up with that about 15 years ago. I referred to it as my statement of intention for my company. And I think it applies in all facets of life, but especially when we look at being organized, when we look at the way that we use our time, when we look at the priorities that we set in our life. On your handout right there, if you printed that out, if you've not, we can get you one later. But if you printed your handout, I want you to look on there. The, very, the thing at the very top uh, is an opportunity for you to think in terms of, I'd like to do what if I had more time? If you had that extra hour a day, what would you spend it on? Even if you don't have the handout, grab a blank sheet of paper, flip over on the back, whatever you need to do. But what would you do? Would you work out? Would you read more? Would you pick up a hobby? Would you go back to school? Would you spend time with family? Take just a moment and jot down very quickly three or four or five things that you'd like to do if you had more time. And even though the teacher can't see you, no cheating off of your neighbor.
give you about another 30 seconds to finish that up. All right, if you'll begin to wrap that up. Okay, now hopefully you had an opportunity to, to jot a few things down there or at least wrap your mind around that. The reason I start that way is uh, we all have discovered by this point in our life there's only two things that will make people change behavior. One is a reward and the other is a consequence. Either there's something good enough out in front of me that I want to chase after that, or there's something daunting enough or bad enough behind me that I want to run away from that. Hopefully by writing those things down that you would like to have time to do, that you would like to have the opportunity to do in your life, will be something that will drive you to change your behavior, to be more organized so that you can become more efficient and you can become more effective in the time that you're spending at work. I think as we look at this, and, and now that we've kind of set the button on here's where we want to go, we need to look at where we are. Jane Wentworth made this statement. It's easy for people to get stuck in the thinking that got them where they are today, even though that thinking cannot be used to get them where they need to be tomorrow. And that seems simplistic, but, I mean, look at the picture there. The future of business, secrets to staying on the cutting edge, and it's on a VHS tape so nobody has any place that they can play it. And we get caught in this mentality of if I just do more of what I've always done, it will take me where I want to go rather than I have to think completely differently if I'm going to get where I want to go. And that brings me to the point that I think we have to rethink time if we're going to achieve maximum productivity. I think we've got to refocus or we've got to shift our perspective or, or we maybe have to just uproot and go a totally different direction from where we've been before. One of the things that I find to be true as I watch people in the workplace and as I work with some companies month in and month out, I mean, in more than you know, once a month, and I see people in their daily routine, I find it to be more and more true what Paul Meyer said. Time is usually wasted in the same way every day. And when you look at that, I don't know that you're putting your face on the copy machine or other body parts and, and sending out uh, you know, uh, photocopies of, of your face or something else. But I do think we do things on a regular basis that cost us time. And whether it's staring at a fax machine while papers go through and whether it's you know, staring at a printer or a computer while it processes, whether it's sitting on hold not doing anything or waiting for someone for an appointment who's late by two or three minutes and we let that time slip away, we're doing those things in many instances to ourselves. And in the same way, this organization is doing that to us as well, where we continue in those same patterns or habits. And think of some of the rewards of being better organized. I mean, you would be less stressed. You may cause someone else less stress. You'd be more productive. You could be more efficient. Certainly would look more professional as people who work around you or come into your uh, workspace see that. And, uh, you know, I think we have great intention. We just don't have much discipline or much commitment in that area. And so to drive this point home, I want you to look back at the list that you made just a minute ago, the things that you said you wanted to do. And I want you to reread that. But this time I want you to say it like this. I don't really want to whatever you said. I don't really want to read more. I don't really want to work out in the yard more. I don't really want to go to the gym more. As difficult as it may be, I don't want to spend more time with my kids. Because the fact is if you really wanted to do it, you would have made time for that already. You would have gotten organized already. You would have made those things a higher priority. And there's nothing I can say in the next 45 minutes or so that's going to change that for you. You won't ever have time for it. You're going to have to make time for it. You're going to have to make being organized a priority. It's going to have to become something that you decide in your mind, I am willing to overcome this, even though it's never come naturally to me. I mean, think about it. how many of you really have time to be on this phone call right now. I mean, we, we've got our, our pile is getting higher, our voicemail box and email box are getting more full, and here we sit trying to learn how to overcome the demons that we have in our mind. So I can show you how to be more organized and more efficient, but you've got to take those necessary steps in order for that to be a reality. 
Now, as we move toward specific things you really can do, I want to kind of talk to you about some truths about time. I mean, this is kind of like when you were back in high school. And, you know, you went to English class, you wrote a paper, you thought, man, that's going to be a great paper. And you get it back and the teacher gave you a C minus. You may have been able to turn that into a different teacher and gotten a different grade. But in that particular class, the teacher gave you a C minus because it's subjective. In that same school building, you walk down the hall to math class, and if you get a problem wrong, it's wrong. If you get it right, it's right. There is no gray area, no subjectivity. Well, the things I'm about to show you are math class for all of us. They, they apply to all of us. Number one, you have all the time there is. If you've got your hand out there, that's the first thing on your hand out filling in the blank. You have all the time there is. You already have 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The only thing you don't know is when that's going to come to an end. And at that point, your pile or your you know, priorities that didn't get done are somebody else's problems to deal with at that point. Okay? Second thing is time is a perishable commodity and a non-renewable resource. Time is a perishable commodity and a non-renewable resource. In other words, it's going bad or going away all the time, and once it's gone, it's gone. It's never coming back. And so we've got, to, we've got to pick up speed. We've got to get out into that current in the river and, and work with that understanding. Number three, third point, to be a good time manager, you have to take ownership of the way that you use your time. I mean, how many of you have ever made the statement, I didn't have time to do that? Well, let's refer back to rule number one. You had all the time that there was. So what would be a more accurate thing to say? I didn't make time for that. I didn't take time for that. Uh, if it's your boss that's asking, I had other things that absolutely had to be done before that, but I was just about to work on that right now. But we've got to take ownership of it, knowing that nobody else took it away from us. We made the choices of the way that we organized, the way that we used our time, the way that we prioritized things. Right? Number four, time is all you have with which to make a living. Time is all you have with which to make a living. Now, you know, when you look at this, people say, well, you know, that's not necessarily true. Well, yeah, it is true. I mean, because no, whether you're paid on commission, whether you're paid on billable hours, or whether you're paid by the hour or on salary, I don't typically find people at any point in life who are looking for an opportunity to spend more time at work. You know, I find people who want to spend less time at work or people who want to get more work done in the same amount of time. But, uh, you know, when we think about that, Time is all you have to trade to get the paycheck you're getting to have what you're going to have. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. All right, rule number five, everyone has the same amount of time. Everyone has the same amount of time. The late football coach Woody Hayes said the only thing even in this world is the number of hours in a day. The difference in winning and losing is what you do with those hours. So you have to think about what you can do to become that super producer type person um, who really seems to get more done than anybody else. Uh, and, and it really is just amazing. And, and you know, you think about it. how do some people get so much done? How do some people become so efficient and not have to work so many hours or they're not disorganized, their office or their workspace is not a complete mess? Well, as with money, the person who invests their time most wisely is the one who gets ahead. It's the person who invests their time most wisely in staying organized or keeping up with their system or asking someone for help on how they can do that who gets ahead. And, and it's not to say getting ahead in the race. It's just achieving their goals of what they would rather do with their time. And so when I teach time management, I'm sorry, when I teach life balance seminars and, and things of that nature, I refer to this as investing your time as spending it on things that are going to help you to live a balanced life and to achieve or maintain your core values. You know, you're investing them in things that are going to last much longer than today and carry a bigger price tag with them. Henry Ford said, it's been my observation that most people get ahead during the time that other people waste. And so I want you to think about, you know, where are you in that? And, and how difficult would it be for you to shift from a person who you know, generally disorganized generally somewhat not prioritized in crisis mode and firefighter mode to someone who is spending their time doing things that are going to pay back long-term for them, okay? All right, 
Jeff, at this point, have we received any questions from anybody uh, other than just the list of, uh, of time bandits? No, nope, no questions yet, but you forgot to tell them that that picture is of me. Uh, yeah, I, I told Jeff yesterday I've not met him face-to-face, -face, and I wondered if that was him, and he confirmed that it, in fact, was. He said that was when he was on vacation a couple of weeks ago. So that is an yeah. up-to-date, uh, real-life real photo, right? No, no airbrushing there. Exactly. So, well, well, let's let's shift into this idea of how we can become more organized and how we can become more efficient. Uh, and I think that as we look at this, again, we've got to encompass some things beyond just our desktop, beyond just our filing system. Um, I heard a gentleman speak, and I said, Jeff probably is familiar with him, may know him personally. I don't know him personally, but I had the, I had the privilege of hearing him speak a couple of years ago, and then Dan Thurman, and he said this, great time management isn't doing a lot more things. It's doing one thing at a time quickly. And I think that a lot of us get caught up in this mentality of I have to do so many things at one time, but what we're doing is we're actually slowing ourselves down because our, our attention is diverted. And, and we've got stacks and piles and, and all these things that are around us, and we're convinced that we have a handle on them when really we're just doing our best to keep up with them. So let me ask, hopefully some of you have sent some things in. Jeff, what were some of the things that were listed as time bandits uh, that they sent into the list? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the top 20. <laughs> Otherwise, we okay, might be yeah. here the rest of the afternoon. But um, right. multiple people's opinions. Uh, too many interruptions seems to be a big one for most people. Um, okay. One says just other people. <laughs> uh, being proactive rather than reactive. Lack of direction. Uh, never feeling caught up, crazy supervisors who are not my supervisor, <laughs> um, <laughs> spending too much time in my day answering uh, emails, keeping emails under control, uh, multitasking, controlling paper and, and uh, piles of paper. Um, there are some industry-specific ones here. Uh, biggest challenge pers uh, to personal productivity is keeping interested in the task. Uh, and then we've got open door policy causes distractions all day. Okay, all right, those are good ones. Now, um, you know, the the being interested in the task, uh, the the crazy supervisor part, um, those are things that you you would kind of wish we had a a magic wand that we could shake and get rid of those folks. And and that's a whole different seminar for me to teach. I mean, uh, interested in the task. I, I talk a lot about employee engagement and uh, you know personal excellence. Um, crazy supervisors, I, I guess every place has one of those. But the rest of these, uh, definitely, I've got on the list of things that I was planning to talk about today because they are common to almost every industry. And so let's begin to weed through these. And, and uh, as we get toward the end of it, if I go over one and move to a different topic and have not answered your specific question, if you'll top those into Jeff, we'll come back to those in a few minutes. Okay. So I think the first thing that we've got to think about is we've got to eliminate these time bandits. You know, we've got, to, we've got to take time to focus and realize where is my time going? What's robbing me of my time? Is it people? Am I my own worst enemy? Is the way our system is set up within our organization robbing me of time because we have so much redundancy or things are not uh, allocated to different uh, departments or personnel in a, in a logical fashion? But the most important thing is, regardless of what you came up with just now and may have typed in as you sent that to Jeff, every once in a while you need to step back and analyze where it is you're losing your time. Where are the cracks in the bucket? If we had more time, I would use an illustration that I often use about we're losing cracks, we're losing water from cracks in our bucket. If you don't ever look at that and you just continue in crisis mode or, or, or you know, reactionary mode, as somebody said proactive versus reactive, we're going to talk about that in just in a minute then uh, you're never going to figure out where that time is going. If we always feel like we're playing from behind, then we're never going to feel like we have time enough to figure out how we can get ahead. So we just continue to pedal as fast as we can on the treadmill or the gerbil wheel instead of trying to get on the road and running forward. Okay, So that's the first thing I would challenge you to do is, is figure that list out for yourself and then begin to look for ways that you can address those things that are robbing you of your time. Okay. As I said, in many instances, we're our own worst enemy, and I think that starts with being organized, you know, just the general principle of being organized. But as I said earlier, this is more 
and just cleaning off your desk. I mean, I want you to think about this for a minute. If, if I were to go tonight and eat a big salad for supper, that would not automatically make me healthy. If I were to go and ride my bicycle 100 miles this weekend, that wouldn't make me in shape. In fact, it would probably mean I was in the hospital, not in shape. But it's kind of the same difference as somebody saying, oh, I, can't, I spent Friday afternoon or I came in Saturday morning, I came into the office this weekend, and I cleaned off my desk. All that really means is that you're probably not going to be able to find anything for the next few weeks because you stuffed it in drawers or shredded some things or filed it away in, you know, in an archive closet down the hall. It doesn't mean that you got organized. It means that you picked up and cleaned up. So I want you to think about, you know, somebody said in that that they have, you know, the piles of things that are piling up on them. How many of you have a stack of, of papers on your desk? And maybe it doesn't look like this desk. And, and let me just say, I get this question often. That is not staged. That is real. I know this guy. I finally had to put the frowny face over him because I was doing presentations at places where people knew who he was. But how many of you have a, have a stack on your desk that you would refer to as your to-do stack or your inbox? And it just never seems to go away, and it never seems to get smaller. I want to give you an idea of a way that you can get rid of that in a way that you can organize your desk. And, and this is not on your handout, but it is well worth writing down. I often get the comment, this was the most valuable piece of information I gave. I would encourage you to set up what I refer to as an incline file sorter. If you go to the office supply store and ask for an incline file sorter, they'll bring you to something that will have slots, and it gets higher to the back so that as you put folders in on end, the further to the back they go, the higher they are so that you can see all of those tabs. On my website, and, and that information will be available to you later, uh, how to get there. On my website, you can click on the free resources uh, button, and there's an article in there about how to set that up. But that's your initial thing, and you want to fill it with folders that are going to allow you to have a place for your most commonly accessed pieces of paper, documents, forms, things that are coming in, things that are only on your desk for a few days before they get processed out or whatever it may be. And it allows you to put those in a priority order. It allows you to put them into a system where you will see them every day or two or three times a week. It allows you to put those into a, a logical sequence that will allow you to not only keep up with it all but to know where it is, to access it quickly when you need it, and to work through it in an efficient and timely manner. You know, as you're trying to get your office organized, you want to have a place for everything. Have a reason why it is where it is. Why is this folder in this drawer? Well, this has to do with research. This has to do with past research. This has to do with vendor or customer contact. This has to do with internal things. This is my CYOA in good Texas speak, you know, covering yourself on down the road, keeping a copy of an email or keeping a copy of the company insurance policy. You may have a drawer that's just for personal stuff with tech stubs and things like that. And then you want to question, you know, why do I need this, whatever this may be, a roll of tape or a stapler or something like that, why do I need this on my desk or in my work area? You know, simple tools will help you. Hanging file folders, manila folders to go within them, having 15 or 20 of those at your desk at all times so that when you come up with a piece of paper that doesn't have a place, you create a place for it and you put it in the correct drawer, in the correct hanging file, grouped with other things that are similar in nature. You know, for some people, a trash can is a great organizational tool because they just need to learn to throw some things away. And here's the way this works. Don't come in and spend three or four hours on a Friday or, or all of Saturday morning cleaning up. I would encourage you, as you pull a sheet of paper out of that stack, don't put it back in there. Put it in the right place. If it doesn't have a right place, make one. When something new comes to your desk from someone else, put it in the right place. And again, if there's not a right place, make one. Now, if your desk looks like this gentleman's right here, it may take a little bit extra concerted time, 15, 20, 30 minutes a day. But the thing is, if you do it regularly, if you do it consistently, eventually that pile will go away and it will become part of your daily routine. The beauty of this system is, even if you're in a paperless company, you can set your desktop of your computer up the exact same way and you can set up your Outlook or your email platform in similar fashion as well by using smolder folders and smart folders and subfolders and things like that. 
you know, having dozens of icons on your desktop is much like pulling out a file and just throwing the paper all over your desk. Very similar in nature to that. Um, other tools on my website, articles and things that will help you to get better organized, but from a 35,000 foot view, there is a way to get the top of your desk more organized. All right, Jeff, at this point, any more questions that have come in in regard to that? None, Randy. I'm encouraging people right now. Don't forget to ask your questions before the end of the webinar. Okay. And, and think about this. As you look at organization, I mean, it's, it's very similar to dieting, very similar to exercise routine. Which is easier, keeping up or catching up? You know, when I ask that in a seminar, almost everyone agrees that it's easier to stay caught up than it is to try to catch up. So, so push yourself. Spend a few extra minutes at the end of the day each day, 10, 15 minutes at the end of the day, not an extra, like I said, big block of hours, and then stay caught up once you get to the end of that. Okay? All right. The next thing I would encourage you to do, use some sort of personal productivity or organizational tool. Use some sort of personal productivity or organizational tool, whether you use a bound calendar, um, a, a printed calendar that you printed off, a desktop calendar, or something electronic, which I, I would definitely encourage you to do that. But, but the magic is not in the tool that you're using. It's in the mindset that you have. But have one central place where you're putting everything. And, and Post-it notes is not an organizational tool. That's a cry for help. If you've got Post-it notes stuck up everywhere, and I know somebody in some room is pointing across the room at somebody else or laughing at themselves. But you've got to find a central place to keep up with phone numbers that have the name attached to them, to keep up with future dates, uh, to keep up with your list of things to do, to keep up with projects. And whether you download apps such as Evernote or Reminders or things like that, or just use the bare bones calendar, it will really, really help you to be more productive and more organized if all of that is in one place and it's not on sticky notes that are falling all over the place, loose sheets of paper that are getting turned and tattered and sticking out of the corner of a notebook or something like that. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I can give you on this is as you use a personal productivity tool, always enter the next step now. Enter the next step now. That way I don't have to keep up with somebody asked me to call them back in a week or we set a meeting and I feel sure somebody's going to send me a reminder about that meeting ahead of time. Just go ahead and enter that next step now into your calendar or personal productivity tool and you'll have it when the time comes. Okay? Next thing I would encourage you on, you ever feel this way about life? I mean, you just look up and, and something that you sort of knew was on the horizon somewhere is all of a sudden upon you. And, and we just feel like, man, I know I should have done a better job for planning for that, but I didn't. Well, I want to encourage you to plan ahead so that you can be proactive instead of reactive. Plan ahead so that you can be proactive instead of reactive. And what I mean by that, on Friday afternoon, look at all of next week. See what's coming up. At the end of the month, look at the, or at the end of the week, look at the in, in, in entire week and further maybe. At the end of the month, look at the next month and see who's on vacation or when you have to go to a conference or a meeting or when you're going to be on vacation or when holidays are. But at the very least, spend the last five to ten minutes of the day planning for tomorrow. You know, a lot of people say spend the first ten minutes of the day. I would encourage you to spend the last ten minutes of the day planning for tomorrow. Several reasons why. Number one, if I suddenly realize I've got more to do tomorrow than I can possibly get done in the normal hours, and I need to be somewhere to pick up my kids at 5 or 5.30, then I know I need to come in early. It will give me the opportunity to gather resources ahead of time. It's fresh on my mind who I did and did not talk to today. And psychologists even tell us that we will sleep better tonight if we've got a plan in place. So plan ahead on the afternoon before, the week before, or even the month before. The next thing, master the idea of sequencing or succession. Master the idea of sequencing or succession, putting things in the most logical order during the course of the day. And I've got that Thanksgiving table out there for some of our friends who are not in America. Thanksgiving is such a huge deal. Um, you know, it's like, it's like the culmination of gluttony in America. But what we do, whoever's preparing that meal, some things, they, they can bake pies a day or two before and put them in the refrigerator. But that bread needs to come out of the oven at the very last minute so that it all goes to the table and it all fits very nicely. Well, I would encourage you to look for ways to fill in the cracks during your day. 
put things in the most logical order, and then as you go between those big tent pole events during the day, what could you do to save yourself a few minutes here or there when you're sitting on hold or when you're waiting for somebody who's a couple of minutes late for an appointment? What could you do to steal a few minutes back? And, and as I said earlier, you know, when we're looking at putting these in a logical sequence, this is more than just filing, but it is a mindset that will last all day. And let me encourage you this. Write this down. Do the worst first. You've probably heard that before. Do the worst first. Get it out of the way. You pick up speed during the course of the day. You're less stressed. Your mind works better. Go ahead and call and have that un- unpleasant conversation that you know is coming. Go ahead and get that report out of the way. Go ahead and walk down the hall to, to talk with somebody and, and, and you know endure that person that maybe you don't have great personality chemistry with. And get it out of the way first. And then let the rest of your day go better by doing the worst first. Next thing, systemize recurring tasks. Systemize your recurring tasks. Consider the things that you do regularly, daily or weekly. Make a list of them if you have to. And then look for ways to economize your time and effort on those. Learning new technology, setting up an address book in Outlook or another platform such as that putting together templates that you can use over and over again for reports. Again, having a place for everything in your system. I felt a little bit hypocritical as we started, Jordan, this about 15 minutes before I started this webinar. I had to clean off my desk so that I didn't feel hypocritical by showing it to you. But everything had a place. So in a very short period of time, I got my desk completely cleaned up because there's a system in place there. If you look at something and you're doing it and you realize there's a faster way to do it, stop what you're doing. Do it the faster way. It will train your brain to move to that, that more efficient thing. But whether it's reports, recording data, sharing information with other researchers or team members or regular meetings that you have, look for things that you can do to save time on the things that recur in your schedule over and over again. I would say this. As you're going through your day, use caution when multitasking. Be careful when diverting attention. Researchers at MIT came out with a, with a study a few years ago that proved that multitasking really does take us more time than it saves us. So, again, you need to step back and look and say, what are the things I'm doing that are costing me time? What can I, how can I do them in a different order? Or how can I systemize that to go forward? And I'm going to pay you the compliment of saying, thinking that you'll do that after we get off the phone today and we're giving time for it now. The next thing, delegate tasks that someone else can do. Delegate tasks someone else can do. There are some things only you can do. There are some things that have to have your eyes looking at them, that have to have your signature on them, or have to have you present in a meeting. But there are other things that we take on that could be delegated. And some people say, well, I don't have anybody to delegate it to. Well, here's another way to delegate. Your boss comes to you and says, I need you to work on this. And your response is, well, you know, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. But in your mind, you're thinking, well, I'm already working on this other thing that they told me to have done today. Say to them, I'd be glad to do that. But let me ask you a question real quick. I'm trying to finish up this report or this study or whatever that you wanted me to have done by Friday afternoon. Would you like for me to stop working on that for a few minutes and work on this new thing that you brought me, or would you rather me continue on with this until I'm finished and then take that up? You have just delegated back to them to be the one who has to set the priority for that. Without being unprofessional, you've given them the responsibility for deciding what it is that needs to be done first, okay? Don't work to make someone else's else's problems your problems. Let them keep their problems, and you work, well, you know, let me just take care of it for you this time. Well, you just added one more thing to your pile that you've already said is already full and, and is overflowing, okay? As often as possible, and I know this can't happen all the time, as often as possible, invest your time on the most important, and you might even put in parentheses there, or the most profitable task from a long-term perspective. As often as possible, invest your time in the most important or profitable task from a long-range perspective. That's not always going to mean the person that's yelling loudest. That's not always going to be the person who has sent you 15 emails and left you three voicemails. Sometimes the most important things will sit quietly in the corner until an opportunity passes us by or until deadline is looming and we can't put as much time into it as we would like to do. And at times we do have to give it to the most pressing thing and not the most important because of who's asking. 
but quite often we do that to ourselves just because somebody is is left with so many voicemails. We want to get them, uh, you know, off of our radar screen. I would encourage you in this. Peter Drucker made this statement: effectiveness is doing the right thing. Efficiency is doing those things right. As you organize your priority, as you organize your daily schedule, you have to focus on doing the right thing before you work on doing them as right as you possibly can. Okay, This was the number one thing that Jeff brought up, and, and I know it is a big problem in the workplace today, but we want to re- work to reduce or eliminate unexpected opportunities, which most of us re- refer to as an interruption. Now, keep in mind, your customers are not an interruption. Oftentimes, your job, the work that you have to do, the research you're doing, the reports that you're producing, those are not an interruption, even though we may not have done a good job of planning for those. But we view them that way. Um, So, you know, when you look at this, you want to try to look and say, how can I help my team eliminate those, and how can I train people to not come and interrupt me quite as often? Find professional ways to, you know what, I'd be glad to help you with that. Can I come to your office in about 15 or 20 minutes when I finish what I'm working on now? You know, when you go to someone else's office, I've got something I need to ask you about, but if you're in the middle of something, I'd be glad to come back in a few minutes. And, again, by doing that, you've earned the right to ask that same privilege from them, but to eliminate those. And then finally on this part, I would say that you've got to learn to say no to things that you don't have to do that don't help you to achieve or maintain your core values. And you may say, well, my core value is not to do this one small task, but I have to do it each week. Well, if that's helping you to maintain your job and maintain productivity and and continue to make uh, money to provide for your family, then it is a means to an end, which is to provide for your family. But we volunteer for Christmas party committees and golf tournament committees and, you know, the Rotary Club and different things in our community that really are a good idea, but that they're not part of the core of who you are at this point in your life, and you have to learn to say no to those things. Um, You know, it it may be hard for some people to say no. Here's a diplomatic way to do it. I appreciate you asking. I'm flattered that you would include me in that. Based on the commitments I've already made, I don't feel like I can give that the kind of time it deserves right now, and I wouldn't want to give it, it, not give it the kind of attention it deserves. So, again, I appreciate it, but at this point, I feel like I'm going to have to just pass on that. They may walk away mad simply because they've got to ask somebody else, and you've always said yes. But at that point, you've said no to something that maybe wasn't going to get you where you needed to end up or where you wanted to be by the end of the day or the week or some point further in the future. You may have to just decide what won't get done. Um, you know, one of the things I thought of, I've got a whole presentation on this, uh, and I thought for researchers it probably would do well to say it here. Don't let perfectionism become procrastination. Don't let perfectionism become procrastination. You, you, at some point you just need to say, that's good enough, and I'm going to tell you, I've already proofread it, I've already looked over it, I've already checked the data three times, four times, five times, I'm going to send it downstream. But here, this may be the most important thing I say to you during their entire time together today. If you don't learn to consciously say no to some things, then you will continue to unconsciously say no to other more important things. If you don't learn to consciously say no to some things, then you will continue to unconsciously say no to other more important things. Now, as we look back through those, that's kind of a, a, a breaking point there in the conversation. I know many of those deal with time management or that realm of things, but when you think of it, they all play into how organized you are. You think about it this way. Have you ever spent all weekend cleaning your house? All weekend you have done everything around the house, laundry is put up, the kitchen is clean and everything, and then somebody leaves a spoon in the sink or a dirty sock in the floor, and you're just about ready to either sell somebody on eBay or crack them on the head. But at the same time, there's other times I could come into your home and dump the kitchen trash in your living room floor and nobody would notice any difference. All of that goes in together to create the mindset you have, the approach that you take, the the self-discipline that you're willing to subject yourself to to say, you know what, I could stay for five, ten more minutes and be completely cleaned up and have a fresh start tomorrow as opposed to coming in tomorrow to this messy desk. Okay. All right, Jeff, uh, at this point, before I shift gears just a little bit, any questions that have arisen at this point? Yeah, 
Um, you may have touched on this, Randy, but how much of office organization should we delegate or should be the responsibility of an administrative assistant? Well, I, I, want, I want control over the things on where they go. But once that system is set up, if you can delegate that to someone else who can put it in its correct place, somebody that you trust with proprietary information and that you trust to continue the system in an orderly fashion and not get things lost, I've, I have now hired my 17-year-old son, and he spent much of yesterday afternoon doing that very thing. Uh, there are other things, though, that I need to be the one to filter through those. I need to be the one to decide whether I'm going to hang on to them and follow up on that in a week or whether I'm going to go ahead and send it downstream without a final answer in the hope that it comes back to my desk or back to my inbox. And so I think you've got to decide. I can't give you an all or none answer on that. There has Some of those things fall into the stack of, would you please take care of this while I'm out of the office this afternoon? Other things are, please don't touch that. I want to be the one to put that up. So I hope that fairly answers that question, but there's not a, an either or on that. I think there's some of both to that. Okay. How about this? How do you entice people to get directly to the point in a courteous way? I hope that's not directed at me. But, uh, no, it is. And then, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> You know, one thing you got to keep in mind, and I talk about this a lot in my communication training, that's a personality preference. That's not a one person is right and one person is wrong. Some people want to see all the details of the book. Other people want to read the last page first and ask questions if they have them. So one of the things that I will ask, my wife sometimes doesn't go directly to the point, and I'm, I'm a pretty directly to the point person, and I will say I don't hear a question in there. Or what is it that you need from me in this? Or is there something specific that you're going to ask me to do as a result of this? Because I'm short on time right now, but I do want to make sure that I give you what you need out of this conversation. And so by, by stating the fact that I'm not telling you to shut up and go away, I just need you to move forward more quickly. And I encourage people to train those that work around them, including their boss, you know, the, the mentality of managing your manager, Train them how to best communicate with you. Train them how to best deal with you through some tactful statements such as, I'd be glad to talk with you about that later if you need more time, but if you need it right now, I need to know specifically what you want from me on this. And then if I need to ask questions, I'll back up and ask questions from you. I'll refer to it as backfill. I'll move backwards and get backfill on that because I'm very much that way, so I can relate to that. And it was kind of like our conversation yesterday, Randy. I was trying, Randy and I were talking, and I was telling him that we are two different personality styles. And so it's kind of we would have to learn how to work together better and to work with each other in a way in which we need to be worked with. Does that, does that make sense? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And I worked with a guy for uh, all in all about 13 years in three different positions, three different jobs. Um, and he was very much the way you are, very non-detail oriented. I mean, he was the kind of guy, let's have a party. And I was the one who would order the plates and the cups and the napkins and send out invitations. And, and we just knew he wanted the big picture. And if he ever wanted details, he came to me and asked, and I would have it in a simple form where I could give it to him, but I didn't give it to him unless he asked. So, yes, right. I, that's exactly, that's a great point. Great. Here's another one. Uh, if your boss asks you things that are not in your area of responsibility, how do we respond? I would probably go back to the same thing that I said earlier on the delegating back upstream. You know, I'd be glad to help with that in some way. I mean, obviously that's not my area of expertise, but I would be glad to be a part of that if you would like for me to. I just, I'm going to need a little bit of time to ramp up or to, to get filled in on what has happened to this point because – I was under the impression so and so was was had ownership of that, or I thought the so and so department was going to have that project, and so I don't ever want to come across as unprofessional or unwilling or I'm not a team player, but through that response, you kind of stated, I'm a willing participant. I'm just not an expert on this, nor have I been involved with it to this point. And do you want me to stop what I'm working on now that you've asked me to have finished by the end of this week or this month in order to do that, knowing that that's going to delay the completion of the original project you had me working on? Because, see, I want to state it in a way where he sees what's in it for him or she sees what's in it for her instead of just, I don't want to do it. 
right? Is, so is saying it's not in my job good. description probably isn't the best. Yeah, I don't know that I would lead with that. I probably that that's what falls into the other tasks deemed necessary by management. I think that's where that phrase comes from. Okay. How about this? Uh, could you address managing multiple projects? Uh, timeline interruptions are the biggest challenge. Yeah, and that's that's a whole you know that's a seminar unto itself. But here's here are the things that I would say as you start into each project. I think you need to look at the scope of the project, and and really I look when I do project management training, I talk in two halves. There's the people, and the task. You know, there's the people and the process. The people are going to tell me who is helping, who's responsible for what, when are they going to do it is on the process side. So I want to decide who's involved in the in the initial phases, who's involved in the legwork part of it, who's involved in the final rollout, selling it to a client or or presenting it to uh, the, the potential client, the client in the end, because those may not be the same people. And then I'm going to lay out a timeline that goes with that. I need to make sure that I'm working with the others on the team to know if they're going to be out for part of that, or if they're going to be sidetracked on something else that's coming in, well, we're going to have a two-week window in the middle of November when we're not going to be able to do anything. I need to know that ahead of time. And then as I'm managing those, um, and, and it doesn't look like we're going to have time to get completely through this part or even really into it, uh, that I was going to spend this – we're spending time on the crux of what I wanted to talk about. But you need to budget or allocate time to those projects in much the same way that you would budget or allocate money for a car payment and a house payment and insurance and gas and groceries and things like that, you would allocate time ahead of time, not just whatever mood you're in today, not just whatever, whichever one has filtered its way to the top of the pile on my desk, but purposefully allocating time based on the importance of and the immediacy of each project and just say, well, I can only afford to give about six or seven hours this week, or I can only afford to give about an hour and a half or two hours today to this project, because even though this other project is not due until December 31st, I know that we have to work on that uh, consistently between now and then, or we will not have a sufficient amount of data to, to come to a conclusion on that by the time the, the project comes to an end. Okay. And last one, and then we'll let you finish up. But... Um uh, I've often thought about hiring a professional organizer. What are your thoughts? I, I've had a hard time swallowing that, um, and here's the reason. I, I'm, I don't want to disparage that as a, as a vocation. Um, my thing is when that person goes away, in the end, it really still needs to be my system. It needs to be my reasoning it needs to be my structure. It needs to be my order of prioritization. And I think when a professional organizer comes in, it may come very naturally to them. They may see a setup that makes sense, and whether that be to begin to help you with your computer or your, your literal desktop and fill out folders and put stuff in a file cabinet, if I didn't come to that conclusion myself, if I didn't set that up myself, if I didn't think through that and, and reason through that of why I want these where they are and how often I access those, it's going to be more difficult for me to work within someone else's system than it is for me to, to challenge myself, to have the discipline to create and maintain that system long term. Okay. And that battling with that will help you to want to use it more once you have it and to know what changes you need to make to it as they come up. Um, you know, in many instances, a lot of people will have a desk, and the desk will be so full that they can't fit another sheet of paper in it, or they're looking for a file. And I'll ask them, did you set up that system? No, no, it was set up when I took over this desk. And they inherited someone else's instead of creating their own. So from, from my corner of the world, I – don't think it's the best idea. Okay. Great questions. Great answer. Randy, I know you've got a lot more to get through, and we've only got about six minutes left. Um, in your storyboard at the top, the slide you want to jump to. So just why don't we let you yeah. finish up? I, I do. And I'm going to, I really am probably going to just finish up with this. And, and we're going to, we're going to ignore the last part of that, even though my OCD will set it in and it'll bug me that we didn't fill in all the blanks. But 
you know, when I ask people to finish this sentence right here, time is almost always, they'll say time is money, the old American adage. You know, time is money, and, and we hear that from the time we're young, and we hear it on the TV and the media and all that stuff. But I want to challenge you with the idea, we waste money all the time. We waste money on Cokes and cigarettes and cable and, and going to the movies and whatever else. And I think if we view time the same way we view money, then we will let it slip away the same way we let money slip away. I want to challenge you to think about the fact that time is life. Whether you're losing time by being disorganized, whether you're losing time because someone's walking into your office and talking to you longer than you expected them to, whether you're losing time because you're not very prioritized or you don't know how to say no to things, you are spending your life on that. And, and I don't know if, if anybody uh, recognizes this picture or not. This is from a movie called End Time starring Justin Timberlake. For some of y'all, that's reason enough to not go see it. But the premise of the movie is, is this very sentence right here. And this is not from the movie. This is my statement. But, but the principle that time is the currency of life. Time is the currency of your life. And, you know, as you, as you think about that, time is all you have to spend for whatever you're going to do or be or have. And th- you think back to the days when, uh, you know, when, when we had to pay for cellular minutes by the minute instead of for a package plan, when you had to pay for the Internet by the minute. If you had to pay for life by the minute, I think it might change the way that we spend it. I think for most of us it definitely would. So in the end, here's what I'd say. Forget everything I've said for the last 50 minutes. You know, forget all the shoulds that I said if you're not going to do them. The important thing is it has to be a system that you will use. You have to discipline yourself to that or it's not going to matter for anyone else. Okay? So from that, any final questions I can answer for you before I wrap up and turn it back to you, Jeff? Nothing, Randy. I, I really appreciate it, and we really appreciate your input. Uh, you've got so much uh, information, I know, and I hope that people will go to the Resource Center. Uh, I know you've yeah. posted and a lot of things there. How, um, if you don't mind, just tell people how they can get hold of you if they're interested. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd welcome that. Uh, if you've got a handout, it's already got my email and my phone number on it. That's because I want people to contact me. But I would say this, you know, if you have heard what I've said today and think, you know, the way that I think is something that you could subscribe to or something that you could agree with, um, there's several things that I do. First of all, on Facebook, so it's getting a little bit old school now. Uh, but I'll put out a thought of the day, a question of the week, uh, time management, communication skills, conflict resolution, uh, getting organized, uh, you know, just life in general, personal excellence and that kind of stuff. It also retweets on Twitter. So if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, it would do that. And then lastly, I would say that I have uh, an occasional – I'm trying to make it to where it's about once a month. I'm trying to be more regular about it. Uh, the reason I say it's not that regular, if I don't have something worth your time to read, I'm not going to send it out. I'm not going to send it out just because it's that time of the month. But, again, on those same topics that I said a minute ago, whether it's how to communicate more effectively and be more memorable or how to, you know, how to do away with conflict in the workplace or better teamwork or whatever, I would invite you to subscribe to that. Uh, and I will not waste your time by trying to you know, just overload you and sell you a bunch of stuff. I'm going to try to give you ideas to live by. Here's the last thing I would say, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff. Until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, you won't change. Until you get tired of being stressed out or I can't find anything or everybody comments on how messy my office is or how I'm you know, the only one who doesn't do this or that or I'm late for meetings or I don't have time to get home and be with my family, until that pain gets strong enough to make you change what you're doing, you're going to continue in the things that you're doing. Here's my hope. I hope that the list you made at the beginning – is compelling enough to make you make those things a higher priority so that you'll begin to look for ways you can change your daily routine. Jeff, thank you so much. Tara, thank you to you and your company for sponsoring me today. Thank you so much. And if you're interested in contacting Randy uh, directly, do so. Uh, Know that he does speak and train and consult. And like all of our presenters, he's available to help your organization with his very specialized expertise. Thank you, Randy. Many of you know that we put together a um, 10 DVD set of the top 10 Lab Manager Academy webinars, the most popular from the past three years. Many of you know or have heard how educational, informative, and how great they are, and many of you know you should be purchasing a set for your training in your lab, and yet many of you know you haven't done anything about it. (laughs) 
This 10 plus hours includes conflict management, organizational skills, lab etiquette, writing effective emails, and six more. And as a special, special, special bonus, we've included the audio of my book, <laughs> Coloring Outside the Lines, and that's free. But as they say on TV, that's not all. For participants of these webinars only, if you enter the coupon code ACADEMY, that's A-C-A-D-E-M-Y, you'll receive an additional 10% off of the original price. Just go to www.academytop10.com. That's the number 10. That's www.academytop10.com and order your 10 plus hours of training for your lab, a refresher for you, or just plain interesting content as soon as this webinar is over. One more time, that's www.academytop10.com. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Unity Lab Services, without whom this webinar series wouldn't be possible. Um, next month, mark your calendars for the first Wednesday of the month for How to Achieve a Collaborative Consensus with professional speaker and author Kristen Arnold. Please mark your calendars for Wednesday, October 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Watch your email for more details. Again, it's my honor and privilege to be your host, and until next month, this is Jeff Tobe urging you to keep coloring outside the lines. Thanks, everyone.